jeez. Look at all that light. Yeah, the other day, uh, I, I made a video, a very quick video topic, just kind of throwing out what I thought was a relatively lukewarm take that in order to get more people into fighting games, right? It'd be nice if there was no barrier of entry to play them. Like a free-to-play sort of game experience where you can just jump in and play the multiplayer of a fighting game for free. The gimmick of the video is that, you know, as fighting game players, we have to literally cross all of our hands, all of our fingers to just pray into the ether that we can get the things that'll allow fighting games to sort of like expand upon. Rollback netcode, crossplay, you know, functioning lobbies, if not hoping that there is free to play elements that allow people to jump in and play the game. Here's the thing. It really, it really hit for a lot of people how much the free to play market has put people off, is what I've understood. Because it, in my eyes, I, I feel like I'm a bit possibly too optimistic. Essentially, in my stupid brain, I'm like, I just wanted to get fighting games as cheap for people as possible to jump in and try something for a relative low barrier of entry, if not no barrier of entry. Uh, however, for so many people, that level of optimism does not exist, and most people are like, oh shit, no, if you do free to play, everything is essentially going to cost more. I have nearly 10% dislikes, which is which doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a lot, even at the thought of fighting games having a free-to-play element of some kind. But where did the conversation begin? Uh, even from the video and what I was talking about, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people ask me, is this game worth 60 bucks? Or even like uh, some games, situations, is this game worth 50 bucks? Because a brand new fighting game is relatively 50, 60 bucks, right? So that question has been popping up for me so much. Like, I'm not going to spend, people say this, I'm not going to spend $60 in a, on a fighting game where there's going to be nobody to play with in like three months. I'm not going to spend $60 on a fighting game if I'm just going to play the arcade mode a couple of times or I'm going to go online just to get my ass beat. That has been... I would say, and it, it's something that I've been telling, I've been saying for a long time, that this is the way a lot of casual people think about their fighting game experience. That they don't want to spend a lot of money just to go and get f***ed up, essentially, by existing players. Or even later on, when like the game is cheap and the Definitive Edition has actually all the content, you're essentially subjecting yourself to the wolves, right? People want to know if they can actually get their money's worth in a fighting game. And for me, it's kind of a tough... That, that's a tough thing to answer because I'm like, well, you got to look at the game. Does the game have great looking characters? Does it have things that look cool? Does it look like something you'd want to spend some time to do? And that that essentially is where you have to put your value in fighting games because, I mean, if we're going to be really real about the situation, the only fighting game that's technically out there that is actually worth your bang for your buck, at least at launch, is, is NRS games. Is games that provide a shit ton of content that people can do in an online and offline situation. Uh, everything else is essentially still an arcade game, for the most part. Uh, and even things like Guilty Gear Strive try to stretch that a little bit with like a story mode, but it's not, it's an unplayable story mode. You're practically watching an anime. This is the root of my conversation to start this whole thing. My, the, the, the topic started that I don't think people, especially when it comes to some of these smaller fighting games that don't have like huge giant and even though guilty gear did sell really well it doesn't sell to the same astronomical levels of like a tekken or a street fighter or a uh something something that's very big right or an nrs game for god's sake or a smash or something crazy big you know and the barrier of entry is is this is 60 bucks the barrier of entry is that you essentially have a full price game where people are like i just don't have a lot to do in the game otherwise fighting games are crazy expensive <laughs> like fighting games are arguably one of the most expensive genres there is if you want to start getting into them if you want to know like your investment if you don't want to know like what it takes to get into a, a, a multiplayer game and just start going at it and learning it and keeping up with it. Uh, fighting games are one of the most technically expensive full priced games there is. Um, and that's because it's based on it's based on an existing model, a seasonal model that has been around for quite some time that started. Well, it's based on a seasonal model that started with 2013. KI sort of started it, but it goes back all the way like to the meme era of like Street Fighter 2 with the Turbo Championship Edition, like all that kind of stuff. It goes all the way back that you were asking people to pay how much more money for a brand new version of a same game type of stuff. 
So there's a there's a big history, right? There's like a, a significantly huge history going back that fighting games are asking you to buy the same product again and again and again. Let's look up a couple of big fighting games that exist on Steam because it has a decent uh, sort of like congregation of how much stuff is available in the game. And in some some of the stuff that people are posting, which is obviously like the, the full screenshots, don't don't tell the full story. So let's just look at uh, Tekken 7 on like Steam, right? T T7 is a good example because it's got a lot of stuff that you can get. Opening up this window and seeing all all this stuff that is technically available here isn't in, for today's perspective isn't technically like correct because there is the definitive edition. However, even the definitive edition of the game was like 110, 120 dollars. Even if you want to buy Tekken 7 and get all the stuff that's in it currently. The, the current deal is 120 bucks. Yeah, don't worry. I, I know all about the Dead or Alive DLCs, right? We already know. If you're in a situation where you're into fighting games and you're playing them actively and you are going to buy the stuff as it comes out, right? You're going to buy the season pass as it comes out. You're going to buy this as it comes out. You're essentially buying the new content for the game as is released. Most fighting games are going to be costing you like 150 to 200 dollars. This is this is not even talking about buying the extra DLC. This is not even talking about the costume cosmetics. This is not even we're talking about core gameplay shit, right? We're just talking about the characters that you're going to be fighting against in the game. Um, and yeah, I mean, Bandai Namco, I'd argue, is one of the biggest companies that that does this a lot. But it's not it's not just limited to them. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that we're still we're still stuck in a very ancient way of of selling fighting games and their continual updates and i think this is honestly one of the things that is as a huge unappealing aspect for people to jump into this shit but tekken 7 is a great game it's it's a great game and because it's a great game it's going to sell well right it's gonna it's gonna be selling well even though let's just say the core game cost you 60 bucks you bought season pass one at 25 bucks uh, so we're at what, uh, 85 bucks. And then you bought season pass two at 30 bucks. So we're at what, 115 bucks. And then you bought season pass three at 25 bucks. These are just like characters, right? And that puts you at well, about 150. Is my math wrong? And then season pass four is 15. So you're at like a hundred. And I don't even know if these are the prices of what these things were when they came out, because these are usually these usually go on sale, right? This stuff is usually cheaper over time. But that is not even including like stages, right? Stages and because these these season passes things, these characters are included. In these season passes. This is why this number isn't exactly representative. But ideally, like yeah, a lot of the stuff that's in fighting games over time, every fighting game is like this. Street Fighter Five, right? And and SF Five has a lot of different championship versions and editions that you can get. But there is a, a metric shit ton, and this is just like the core stuff. In game, it's ridiculous. Like there's there's so much stuff that you can actually purchase on top of purchase on top of purchase. If we were to talk about uh, the one gimmick that Street Fighter V has is that you can get the characters for free. And that's, that's what a lot of the devs were telling me is going to be their big hook of the game. Is that, hey, you can get the characters for free. But the biggest argument behind that is that you might have to play the holy shit out of the game. Like, there's a caveat to that. You're going to have to. It feels like the game was designed to be free to play at the start and then something happened and they just couldn't afford to do it. So the the craziest thing is that Street Fighter V essentially has what most free to play games already do, right? They, they, they are essentially executing what most what most of these games uh, practically market themselves as, but it's a, it was a full price game when it came out. And if you didn't invest the time to get the fight money for all this stuff, you still had to buy characters as they came out. You still had to buy CPT stages. There's been how many of those? Like five CPT stages and, and different things like that. There's a ton. So uh, pretty much if you include like the full price of the game, and I'm not even including the cosmetic stuff and you include all the characters and shit like that, and if there is caveats because you can grind the hell out of the game to get it. You're still upwards of like maybe 150 to 200 bucks of actual content that's released over time. Here we go. We had to go back real far. How expensive are fighting games actually? And this is kind of my point. Fighting games know that their audience is so hardcore for their their franchises and titles and me me included just because I see new shit and you're like, "Damn, let's just let's just go." The amount of crazy shit that was available in Ultra Street Fighter 4, I think people forget was nuts. Not including the fact that you had to buy like the upgrade packs from one game to the next. I think the 
digital upgrade for Ultra Street Fighter 4 from Super Street Fighter 4 was 15 bucks. But you essentially had like, you know, core game of Street Fighter 4 was what, 60 bucks? Super Arcade Edition Ultra Street Fighter 4. But Super Street Fighter 4 was I believe $40 when it came out. And then the, let's say the Arcade Edition upgrade, because I'm not too sure how much it cost at the time, was about $15. And then let's say the Ultra Street Fighter 4 digital upgrade was about also 15 bucks. That pissed everybody off. It did, right? I'm not saying, I'm not saying this stuff didn't piss people off. I'm saying nothing has changed. <laughs> I'm saying none of this stuff has changed. It's, we're still doing it, right? We're still stuck in this sort of, this sort of era of how fighting games are distributed and released. Not to mention the insane costume content that's available. You think the all-in-one 2011 pack might actually include all of the costume for the game, but it doesn't. Like there's the vacation pack, the wild costume pack. Even if you just bought all these, you have to include like all these prices uh, that are available in there. And then you get the really crazy ones, right? You get the dead or alive. Uh, you get the, uh, the, the the insane games that have a ridiculous amount of costumes, technically Street Fighter V costumes. Fighting games are not cheap already. I'm trying to pitch people of like the idea that like, hey, I, it's great to get into fighting games. Is one, I want more fighting games to be made, much less I want people to get an opportunity to jump in and play them in some way. And that barrier exists. It is, it is very challenging for people that look at these things and want an opportunity to get into it to see a $60 plus price tag and be like, crap, holy, holy shit. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't foreshadow the fact that yes, fighting games are also expensive to make. Fighting games are continually getting more expensive for the developers to make. And yeah, even games like Guilty Gear are now bigger than ever before. So in some situations, why would big franchises Tekken um, even Guilty Gear now, because they have shown success. Mortal Kombat. Why would any of these devs change anything? And I don't think they will. This is why most of what I'm saying is like a wish. I have to cross like every finger that they would allow people to play at least the multiplayer of their games for a limited amount, if not completely free. Uh, here's a big one. Mortal Kombat 11. Once again, the stem of the conversation is that a lot of people look at a fighting game now and wonder if there will be enough content in the game to be worth 60 bucks. Do I think MK11, if not most NRS games, are worth the asking price? Yeah, I do. I think at least the $60 asking price of to jump into a game like MK11, holy shit. That has so much stuff, an incredible story mode. If not, NRS are the kings at making full products out of their fighting game. It's a full-on experience, and I don't I don't think anybody can really disagree, even if you don't like MK. But I'd argue they're like incredible fighting games. Uh insane robust experiences. It's it's very expensive if you want to be caught up with MK11. Because these are discounted combat packs, I believe. Combat pack one was not 1999 when it came out. I think it was more around 25. I think this is discounted. And then the aftermath expansion is still 40 bucks, so that's the same. Uh, the ultimate add-on, this is this doesn't this doesn't count. This is not actually supposed to be here uh, because we're not we're not going to count that. It was 30 bucks, 40 bucks, and 15. All right. So the additional combat packs for Mortal Kombat 11, a hugely successful fighting game, right? Hugely successful, uh, would cost you 85 dollars for the additional required content, the actual DLC, and then. The core game, let's just say, was 60 bucks because that's what most people bought the game as. It's expensive, right? It's crazy. It's crazy expensive. And but why are people spending that? Because MK's worth it, right? MK's worth it. It's got the characters I love. It's got uh, the guest characters that people are willing to spend money on. Like, it, it's definitely worth it. If you were buying it as is. If you waited, you can definitely wait for sales, but that's like a different situation, right? If you're waiting for sales, you're essentially out of the loop. Right? You're you're buying you're you're coming in way down the line where anything's gonna be cheaper later on. The the entire argument I sort of had uh that I continually have with people is that bridging this barrier or breaking this barrier for a lot of people is difficult. And there have been ways that fighting games, some fighting games have approached it in the past that have had success and it has worked out. But there's also several examples of it not going well. Even the thought of putting something that might even allow super greedy devs, super greedy publishers to uh, to essentially 
milk players for way more than what the core game is. And that is truly not what I was thinking. And it might be the optimism in somebody like me. It, it seems like a lot of people are already stuck on this situation that what I have right now is fine. What we have right now is that we're spending upwards of 150 to over $200 on average for the core content of any of our fighting games. And I'm okay with that. In fact, I'm most people are happy with that. While some fighting games I think are worth it. Some fighting games, I think, have enough content to make itself actually worth it. I think that the majority of them, which are mostly arcade games still to this day, and just continually add arcade-style content, aren't really. And it could be it could be difficult for a lot of people to to justify the spending of like sixty to seventy to eighty to ninety to a hundred plus dollars on all this kind of stuff. The next part of the conversation that I wanted uh, to bridge into is. How do you actually do that shit right? And which games have tried things that worked? And which games messed it up so bad that it essentially poisoned the well for the trust of anybody that would be showing up in the future?